Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and start the program. So welcome to Breakfast at Blake. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. My name is, is Dr. Quayley Thompson. I'm a member of the Blake Board of Trustees. My wife and I have two children um, that have been blessed with, uh, with Blake's presence. Um, our oldest, Callie, graduated in 2020, and our youngest, uh, Anissa, is actually a senior here. Um, so uh, very pleasant to be a part of the community. Let me begin with a sincere thank you to the members of the Blake community, its alumni, its current students, and its faculty and staff. I appreciate all of the efforts in creating and fostering an important and wonderful academic institution. And I applaud your perseverance and leadership in navigating through these challenging times the past 18 months. So thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Stavney, the Blake head of school. Ann joined Blake in 2012 and since then has led the school through a successful $80 million comprehensive campaign. She's overseen six capital projects on Blake's campuses, including a new science wing at the upper entry hall on this campus and the dining commons where we're, jo where we're uh, joined today. Anne has led the development of a global immersion program in pre-kindergarten through 12th grade computer science program, which will launch next year. Additionally, she's revised the school curricula in world languages, literacy, mathematics, and humanities. And as an example of the power and impact of this curricula, I had the pleasure of attending back to school night on Wednesday evening. And in one evening, I learned how to extract DNA from a strawberry. <laughs> I had the opportunity to compare sunrise and sunset curves from countries around the world. I learned the nuances of neoclassical economics and behavioral economics. And I analyzed a poem by Carol Ann, Carol Ann Duffy, Miss Midas. So I think every time I've left back to school night at Blake, I've wanted to enroll at Blake. It's a pleasant place. I've appreciated Ann's clear and steady leadership as head of school during the past year and a half. Leading a large independent school is challenging in and of itself. When you add on a global pandemic, um, it's a pretty daunting charge. So through it all, Ann has demonstrated a strong commitment to the health and safety of the community and to the teaching and learning needs of our students and our educators. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ann Staffney. Thank you, Quelly, and good morning. It is wonderful to see all of you. I have the distinct pleasure of giving two awards today. First up is the Jenny Stevens Hagen Spirit Award, which is being given to Malcolm McDonald. Many of you know Malcolm. He had planned to be with us this morning. Unfortunately, personal circumstances have gotten in the way, and he's no longer able to be here in person. I talked to him two days ago. He wanted me to share with all of you uh, how much he wanted to be here and how honored he is to receive this award. Um, I'm confident he's on the live stream this morning. Good morning, Malcolm. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about Malcolm, who first joined the Blake community as a sixth grader. In his later years at Blake, he played on the football team. He graduated cum laude in 1954, and then he went on to Yale University. His career highlights include working for First National Bank in St. Paul from 1980 to 19, uh, 1960 to 1977. After that, he served 25 years at the industrial real estate firm Space Center. His roles there included director, senior vice president, and trustee. Malcolm was also an adjunct professor from 1975 to 1994. Uh, in the graduate manage prog management program at the University of St. Thomas. Since retiring in 2004, Malcolm has been involved in a number of organizations aimed at improving the opportunity gap, closing the opportunity gap, including Project Success, which I think many of you know serves about 15,000 students annually uh, in 21 Minneapolis public schools. 
He also serves on many civic, foundation, and corporate boards. At Blake, he's also been a generous volunteer, a donor, uh, a leader. Some examples, he served on the Blake Alumni Board from 2013 to 2019. He was a class rep from 2003 to 2018, 15 years. He has volunteered in support of the annual fund, now known as the Blake Fund. He was also a lead volunteer in Blake's $80 million Excellence Accelerated Campaign. He chaired the campaign's alumni committee. He co-chaired his own 45th Blake class reunion. Malcolm is a steady present at, presence at so many of our alumni events, including the school's holiday party, breakfast at Blake presentations, annual Golden Bear reunion luncheon, which we had yesterday, various learning works receptions. We tallied up all the Blake events that Malcolm has attended since 2004, so just in the last chunk of time, including his own 50th reunion, and that since 2004, he has attended 58 Blake events, which is great. Um, Malcolm is the living embodiment of the Jenny Stevens Hagen Spirit Award, which honors, and I'm quoting, alumni who have devoted extraordinary time and energy to Blake who have served as a stalwart enthusiast for the school, and who have promoted, attended, and vigorously supported alumni involvement in school events. And before I read the citation, I just want to share a little story. Uh, I arrived here in July of 2012. Um, it was about the end of the first week of August um, that I got a call from Malcolm McDonald um, and I said, hello, and uh, you know, I'm motioning to Elaine, my assistant, who is this, you know? Uh, and uh, he said, I just need to tell you, you're doing a great job. <laughs> and he has um, continued to say that to me every time. I appreciated that. I'd been on the job about two weeks, um, and I'm not too sure what I'd done other than be here, uh, but uh, you know, he has continued to be such a supporter and so positive, and uh, that I just truly appreciate both personally and uh, for the school. Malcolm, today we honor you with this citation. The Blake School recognizes Malcolm McDonald for his outstanding service to the school as an inspiring leader, as a dedicated volunteer, and as a warm and enthusiastic presence in our community. Congratulations, Malcolm. It is my pleasure to present you with the 2021 Jenny Stevens Hagen Spirit Award. We are thinking of you and sending warm wishes. So. Our second award is the 2021 Outstanding Alumnus of the Year. This honor goes to our Breakfast at Blake speaker, Stephen Hogue. You will hear more about Stephen in a moment when uh, Quelly Thompson returns to the podium to introduce him. Uh, we're thrilled to have Stephen with us to receive this award, which honors a member of our alumni community who has demonstrated outstanding leadership, achievement, and influence in their field and community. Stephen, we honor you today with this citation. The Blake School recognizes Stephen Hogue for outstanding contributions to biotechnology, for pioneering leadership, research, and development, and for a profound commitment to and significant impact on global health. Congratulations, Stephen. It is my pleasure to present you with Blake's 2021 Outstanding Alumnus Year, of, Year Award and a bowl. So, yes. You don't have to hold it. Yes, okay. you can set it down. Yeah, right, right. All right. Still takes some getting used to that. So I'm fortunate to have a career that sits at the intersection of biotechnology, healthcare, life sciences, and organizational leadership. Uh, I'm also fortunate to not only have witnessed, but to also be the beneficiary of Dr. Hogue's contributions to this field. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't get into the office today without showing my Moderna vaccination card. So um, dramatic impact, very different. Stephen joined Blake in seventh grade and graduated in 1994. 
After earning a Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience at Amherst College, he went to medical school at the University of California in San Francisco and served as an emergency medical physician in New York City. He then worked for the management consulting firm McKinsey and Company before moving to Moderna Therapeutics in 2012. At the time, Moderna was a two-year-old startup with two dozen employees. The company focused on a promising approach to vaccine development, messenger RNA technology. Eight years later, when we reported the first COVID-19 cases in the United States, Moderna had yet to bring a product to the market. As president and head of research and development, Stephen led Moderna's pioneering approach to develop one of the first coronavirus vaccines to receive United States Food and Drug Administration approval. Moderna is now a household name. And Steve and I have a split family as well in terms of vaccination <laughs> records. It's a household name and the company is valued at about $50 billion. Um, it's a promising player in the future of research and development in this field. Um, we're very delighted to have Stephen join us today. Please join us, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Hope. Thank you. Thank you, Quilly. I am gonna struggle mightily with this uh, because I, um, I have a loathing of podia. <laughs> um, so I, um, uh, I am deeply uncomfortable at the moment. Uh, <laughs> I uh, was joking with Dr. Stavney, your family, that um, I, I've had to testify in front of Congress a couple times in the last year and had to be on TV a lot and all that's been nerve wracking. But standing in front of people who, who knew you before, <laughs> <laughs> who actually know you're full of it, <laughs> is pretty intimidating. Um, and I really don't appreciate that they all sat in the front like that. Uh, so this is gonna be hard. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to work my way through it. Um, it, is a, it is an incredible privilege and honor to stand in front of you and accept this award. When, when Dr. Stavney called me, I thought she'd made a mistake uh, um, and offered it because, first of all, I, I didn't think we'd accomplished anything yet. It was earlier in the year and we had a way to go. Um, but secondly, it just does not feel like I personally have accomplished anything. And um, in many ways, I debated whether it was ever appropriate for me to accept any personal award, and there have been some that have been offered, and I've actually decided not to, except this one. Um, and the reason is that um, it's been an incredible journey these last couple years and the 10 years that, that Qualey was describing, but um, it's definitely been a journey where I have been shaped by others and worked with others. Uh, and it, in some ways, is their work that, that I'm forever representing, whether it's in front of Congress or, or here. Um, and so the reason why I decided to come back um, in the middle of a pandemic, yes, it's still going, yes, we've still got work to do, no, I can't stay much longer. <laughs> uh, but the reason I wanted to come back is to honor uh, this place, the school and the people in the front row who will make fun of me during this talk, uh, and all of you, because um, I am just a product of this place and the other places I've been, um, of the people that I've had the privilege of working with and knowing. And, um, and so if I'm ever going to accept an award like this, I feel like I have to accept it on behalf of, of them and all of you. Um, and so what I'd love to do in the prepared remarks that I have, which is not many, uh, before we get to questions, I'm sure I'll get questions about boosters and other stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, but um, is I'd like to share some of the things I've learned along the way from all of the people, including all of you, that, um, that hopefully contributed uh, to how we've addressed the pandemic so far. So um, I'm gonna boil it into a few things, three big lessons for me. Uh, one is around optimism um, and a very Minnesota concept at the core, I think. Uh, the second is a love of science, something I also attribute to starting here at the upper school um, and the third is the power of information, for good or for bad, I'm gonna focus on the good part. Um, but three themes that I think have, I've learned from, from being a part of communities like this one. So I'm gonna start with the, the optimism. Um, I have come to realize, particularly in the last couple years, but definitely over the 10 years that I've been at Moderna, that optimism is my greatest privilege. It, it, we are 
we are privileged to be a part of the Blake community, for sure. Uh, there are so many other privileges that I have in my life, just as a function of where I was born and how I've lived my life. Great fortune, whether I deserved it or not, that shapes who I am. But I think the greatest privilege I've gotten is optimism. And I actually attribute that to Minnesota, to this community, this group of people. Uh, because the belief that you can make yourself better or make other things around you better, it's actually not a right. It's not something we're born with. Right? It's not that old litany, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, doesn't end with optimism. Um, you have the right to try. You don't have the right to believe in yourself. Um, and optimism, but optimism is at the core of literally everything that shaped my career. And I think it's uh, something that we, we give each other. Uh, just as an example, it sounds great to hear Quayley's retelling of my career. I can assure you it was filled with nothing but insecurity and failure from where I sat uh, all the way through. Um, just one case in point, I was, uh, spent the first 10 years of my life thinking, hey, I, I want to be a doctor. Actually working my way up to that. Uh, and as, as Quayley was describing, you know, coming out of Blake, going through Amherst, UCSF, Bellevue Hospital, I landed in Bellevue Hospital as an emergency doctor in New York, believing that the thing that I was gonna to do to make the world better, that optimism that I had, was actually to care for people uh, who were the sickest. Uh, that was, turns out, not to have been my calling. Um, there was this fantastic experience in the first couple of years of realizing, oh, oh my gosh, I'm not having a big enough impact uh, on the people around me on, the, on this work, and actually losing some faith in my ability to to continue to do good in the world. Um, it was a very difficult and dark couple of years for me. Uh, people who do that kind of work as their career, that's God's work. There's many forms of God's work, but that's some of it. It's really inspiring those that stick to it. I was not one of them. I felt like a failure. Um, and what I needed to do is figure out some other way before I, you know, before I destroyed myself to, to spend my life, to do something that um, I thought I would contribute with. Uh, unfortunately, my wife was also a physician. We had a $38,000 salary. We were living in New York, and that meant I needed a job uh, as well. Um, and so uh, I decided I was going to apply all over the place. I was going to find a consulting job somewhere, because, of course, why not? I went to graduate school. I should find a consulting job. I ended up getting an interview probably on the background of you know, Blake and Amherst and UCSF at a, a firm called McKinsey in New York, um, having exactly zero idea what I was doing. <laughs> Um, and I just believed that if I kept showing up, I was optimistic, if I kept showing up and trying, that somehow um, things would work out. Uh, there, were, there were surreal moments in that optimism that were ultimately proven out, but they weren't guaranteed. Uh, you know, rushing out of a shift at, at, at Bellevue in my scrubs with a paper bag that had a suit in it. Um, <laughs> Bellevue's on 34th in Manhattan. I had to get to 55th to get to the McKinsey office and you know, hopping in a cab, driving to the McKinsey office on, on Park Ave uh, in New York City. There's a, there's a Starbucks down there with one of those little bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> getting into that little bathroom, taking off the, you know, going in, I felt like Superman. I walked in in scrubs. I'd shaved that day at least. Uh, if walked in in scrubs, throw on a suit, you know, took me three times with a tie because it had been a while. Put it on, go upstairs, um, and that was my, my final round interviews. Um, and I remember like carrying the paper bag with my scrubs in it, be like, oh, God, I hope they don't open this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> handing it to the receptionist going in. And I'm like, but I, I just believed, I had to try, I believed I could do it. Now the last round interviews, by the way, McKinsey is famous for case interviews, and so they ask you business problems. Again, I have no business background and no business being asked business problems. <laughs> um, but in the middle of that, um, case interview, my optimism was tested because the guy, the partner, uh, was asking me a question and I thought I was doing okay. And then all of a sudden he goes, Stephen, you mean profit. What? <laughs> Revenue minus cost equals profit, Stephen. <laughs> I'm never getting this job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may have overplayed my hand. Uh, I have no idea why they hired me. Maybe they had like a quota on doctors who didn't understand the definition of the word profit. <laughs> but I was hired. Um, and it, it was the only business I had in that room, even trying, was that I had been raised to believe that we could, we could improve ourselves. We could do new things. We could optimistically move in new directions. I had no other qualifications, I assure you. I'm not even still sure that I would have hired me after many years at McKinsey.
Now that played itself forward seven years, eight years later after McKinsey, you know, at McKinsey, when I went back to those same partners, at that point they trusted me and I said, you know what, I'm in the wrong field. This is great, you guys have you know, taught me a lot about business, but I love science. I love medicine and I am way too far away from it advising companies. Uh, and so I need to go back, uh, blow up my career, um, and go join a tiny little company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, which I'll talk to in a second. But um, everybody thought I was crazy, but I just thought I was just being optimistic. Um, and that has actually informed how we've run Moderna um, for the last number of years. Uh, we describe it as um, accepting risk to have impact, but it's this belief that actually you can have impact. Right? And in, if you're willing to take a chance, if you're willing to have people laugh at you because you don't know the definition of the word profit, uh, or you know, people look at you crossways when you say, I'm, you know, I'm here to help with science, and they go, on what qualification? Um, then you can have phenomenal impact. And that has been something that I think has animated my whole career. I've tried to use it to animate my, my company. Um, but that privilege, sorry, I'll stay off the mic. That privilege is something that was given to me. I wasn't born with it. Um, and it was given to me by this community. Uh, and in that sense, I think we have an obligation, I have an obligation to give it back to as many people as I can. And I think it's something that we, we all probably recognize is, in, in, um, is not in excess right now. We need more optimism and hope. But it, just remember that it's something I think we give to each other because actually all of you gave it to me, um, even maybe too much because I thought I could do things that I couldn't. So optimism is point one for me. Now, the second thing that I recognize as a gift of Blake that I wanted to come back and honor um, is my love of science. It started here. It started in our upper school. Uh, I, I started, uh, many of you were in classes with me, but I started um, in chemistry and biology, not so much physics, it was never my thing, uh, with the idea that there's just the world is really fascinating. Collection of, the science is a collection of facts and learning about it can be so joyous and fun. Um, and I actually remember those first few years of thinking that's what science is. Science is knowledge. And, and that was something, I loved acquiring that knowledge. Um, but it changed. It started changing at Blake, my appreciation of what, sci appreciation of what science actually is. And spoiler alert, science is not a collection of facts. It's an approach to the unknown, right? It is not what you know. It is how you're gonna try and figure out what you don't know. It is absolutely not about the answers. It is entirely about how you're asking the questions. And that thing that was the thing that led me to go off and be a neuroscience undergrad at, at a liberal arts college of all things, <laughs> um, to go into medicine, that idea that, that science is something more metaphysical uh, was something I remember acquiring at Blake. Um, and in some of the maybe most counterintuitive ways. <laughs> um, when I was a junior, or senior, a senior, uh, we, uh, having acquired all of this knowledge, all these facts, and believing that I was good at science because I knew some stuff, um, a, a, a group of us, actually Andy Barine, who's sitting here, uh, Ross Donaldson, myself, um, our AP bio teacher came to us one day and said, hey, there's a, Science Olympiad next, you know, next Saturday. I think it was like a Thursday. I think we had a football game on Friday night. Um, and I think we should enter the three of you guys in that competition. It's the state you know, science Olympiad. And I remember thinking like, what? <laughs> what are we gonna do that for? Of course, Andy was like, we gotta do this. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta show them <laughs> what we can do. Um, and so we, you know, we enrolled in the Olympiad. We went, um, we were not, necessarily the best representatives of the school that day. We showed up. I don't think we had pencils or paper. We had to figure out both in sequence. <laughs> Can I borrow your pencil? Yeah, 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 disruption. Can I borrow your paper? <laughs> but we got through it. And one of the things that I always took from that experience is at the end of it, through some miracle, we ended up third in the state, um, not through preparation. Um, but, but I think because of how we approach those problems. Um, there were team problems, right? It's a science Olympiad, you're there as, three, as a, per, a group of three. And what we were doing when we didn't know the answer looked very different than what other people were doing. We were talking. 
We were like talking it through. How do you do this? What is this thing? It could be this. We were, we were actually reasoning to some version of the answer. Other people were kind of listing things and picking, or one person was doing most of the talking. And I think that, that difference actually stuck with me um, f forever uh, thereafter, which is that science is actually a discourse in ideas, right? It's debating things. It's trying to find something that looks like truth. Um, and it was that that actually carried with me. It carried into Amherst, carried to UCSF. I actually um, did an undergraduate degree in neuroscience and did two years of bench research afterwards, all in basic science. And people used to look at me like I was crazy for doing that. Um, but it was this idea that asking really good questions could be incredibly meaningful. Um, and it mattered much more than all the facts and all the knowledge you'd acquire. And I really think that idea is born from silly things like comp competing in state Olympiads and realizing we weren't prepared. We certainly didn't study the most. We were third. We should have gotten first, for the record. <laughs> but uh, we, 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 uh, we got third on the basis of how we approached those problems. And that thing is what gave me the, the courage to go join Moderna. So let me just tell you a little bit about Moderna and, and how that links. Um, so I have to talk some molecular biology, and I apologize for all of you who, who, who don't know um, the central dogma of biology the way I do. Uh, but um, Moderna is an mRNA company, messenger RNA. That's what it stands for. Uh, and maybe I could demystify all of it by saying that um, life is this really wonderful thing, right, that runs these programs, every cell in your body and these complicated bodies. And it has to send instructions from your genes, your DNA, to the rest of the cell about what it should do. And that's a constant flow of information, right? So if you think of your genes as hardware, it's like the, it's literally the hard drive where you store, store information. And then you think all this machinery of life that we live with and that I am right now, the instructions that go out, the software that comes off that hard drive and tells the body what to do, is messenger RNA. And actually, all of life that we've ever discovered, until Elon Musk come back, come, comes back from Mars or something different, um, all of life is just the flow of information in messenger RNA, right? From, from the hard drive into the cell. And that is, at the core, the idea behind Moderna, which is that if we could find a way to, to actually capture the power of messenger RNA, to actually make messenger RNA, to make software programs and inject them into your body, that your body already knows what to do with that. In fact, it could follow those instructions to prevent disease like COVID, or it could follow those instructions to cure a disease like cancer. It's just a matter of it doesn't know how, doesn't have the information. If we convey that information, it would have a huge and lasting effect. We, we usually think of it as the difference between drug, current drugs act on your body, whereas information sort of unlocks your body's potential. Now, when that idea came across my path in 2012, everybody I know, love, and respected, all three categories, said it was absolutely stupid to try. Um, and for a whole bunch of reasons. Most of them were actually really smart. I mean, I actually, when, when Moderna came across my, my path, there were four employees. I eventually joined, there was about 20. Um, and they were, they were not your typical, there wasn't a Nobel laureate among them, and probably never will be. Uh, they were, they were sort of, you know, they were different, anti-dogmatic in approach. Um, and when I went around and decided, hey, I want to go move into biotech, I started looking at a bunch of companies. There were a lot of very traditional, very interesting companies um, that looked really compelling. But Moderna just kept striking me as odd. And the thing that I couldn't quite get my hand around, but that eventually, you know, sort of resonated for me was that it was trying to pursue a phenomenally big idea, like sort of farcically big, that we're gonna figure out a way to turn medicine into information, or information into medicine. We're just gonna figure out a way to write in software code and then treat and prevent disease. And if we could do that, it'll have this huge dramatic effect. Now, I was not totally daunted as an optimist when people told me that was a crazy thing to do. Um, and so what I, but I was listening to folks at that point. I did have three children uh, and a wife at that point who was a physician. And as much as she loved me, it was probably pushing the boundaries to, <laughs> um, to blow up my life in the way that I was about to. And so she said, hey, you got to go talk to a bunch of people. And I pulled down every scientific luminary I could get access to um, through my life at that time. And a bunch of other people. Read everything I could and went and kept asking people. And to a person 
literally to a person, everybody said, that approach, that idea, messenger RNA, will never work. Never going to work. I couldn't find a single person outside of the company who believed it. And that should have <laughs> probably dissuaded me. Uh, because I eventually was talking to, literally, I talked to Nobel laureates. I talked to uh, Lasker Medal winners and I was talking to professors at MIT and they all kept saying the same thing. Uh, but it didn't because the lineage that I inherited from Blake and UCSF and Amherst was, it's not, you're just giving me the facts. You're just giving me the, you know, what you think the facts say. My job is to understand what were the questions that you asked or you were answering when you, when you did it. And so I kept pushing. I said, well, wait, wait, why? You know, why are you so sure that this can't work? And at the end of the day, people, it boiled down to, well, I once made mRNA in a lab when I was a graduate student. I left it on the table and it degraded in six hours. You can't make a medicine out of something that's that unstable. Right? I said, well, that's, that's not a scientific reason. You know, that's some version of you haven't figured out how to do it yet. Um, and there was another common thread out there, which is you have no idea how you're going to deliver messenger RNA. This sounds really good, Stephen but you have no idea how you're gonna get it into the immune system in a, in a vaccines context or into a cancer cell in the, con in the cancer cell context. And nobody's got those solutions out there. And again, I was like, well, fair, <laughs> but that's a, not a reason not to try. That's a reason that nobody's done it yet. Um, and the more I sort of pushed on those questions and kept asking, well, wait, do we know why mRNA is stable in our bodies, but not stable on your bench top? And the answer was well, not really. Okay, well, that's a really interesting question to go solve. Because if you can make it stable on the bench top, like it's stable in your body, then you might have a medicine. And then similarly, you know, do we know how viruses get mRNA into our cells? I mean, coronavirus gets mRNA into your body, and that's how it infects you. Right? So my point to these people that kept telling me no is, how can this be an unsolvable problem? 100 million years of viral evolution has solved it. Now, I'm not saying there's a guarantee that I will get there or we will get there, but do we know how viruses do this and what can we learn from it and whether we could copy and reverse engineer that? And the answer was, well, no, we don't. But, you know, there's a bunch of black matter, dark magic in the universe and, <laughs> and you shouldn't try. <laughs> um, and it was because I finally landed on those two questions that no, this isn't unsolvable. It's not just been, it's just not been solved. It's not impossible. It's improbable that I decided, as an optimist, um, that I would move forward. And, and it is, I think, because of that love of science, because the, the love of finding the right question to ask um, and then pursuing it. Um, there is a fantastic quote, not from a scientist, from an engineer named Charles Kettering, who actually worked in manufacturing of all things, which is um, a problem well stated is half solved. And it is something that we, um, we live with every day at Moderna. It's shaped who we are and, 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 and what we do. And it is this idea that you getting to the right questions is actually the whole battle. What happens then afterwards is, is, is about um, delivery. And so, um, so we have another, we, we, ex, we express that at Moderna in, in terms of one of our five mindsets, the first being accepting risk and the second being we obsess over learning. We do not believe we're smarter than anyone. You can't. Um, not just because I'm Minnesotan, <laughs> but, uh, but truly, you're just nobody smarter than everyone. Um, but if you obsess over learning faster, if you just obsess with asking questions, pushing yourself, if you learn the fastest, you'll have this compounding effect in terms of your ability to solve problems. So I didn't have to start Moderna or move into the running R&D at a company, completely underqualified, <laughs> um, with a belief that I was the smartest or that I knew something that all of these Nobel laureates or, or, or medal winners uh, clearly didn't believe. I just had to believe that I could learn fast. And that was something, again, that I believe was a gift of, of those who taught me science, including here at Blake. Um, so the third thing um, is uh, that I just want to reference is the, the power of information. Um, and the power of information actually for collective action. So I, um, this is a little bit less a story of, of Moderna, or sorry, of, of Blake, and a little bit more of a story of Moderna, which is uh, to hear the retelling of what we did as um, so certain um, is always a bit jarring. It was never certain. Uh, and along the way, I can assure you we, we failed repeatedly and failed, found many folks who thought we were still crazy. Um, the, uh, 
the company that I joined couldn't make payroll in six months. <laughs> um, we had about a dozen people, um, and nothing we were doing was working. Uh, uh, Qualey said it well. We were Moderna therapeutics, by the way, not Moderna vaccines. <laughs> Uh, we were going to work on curing rare diseases and heart disease, not try and prevent infectious diseases. Uh, and that company um, had raised, an, uh, at the time, it felt like a breathtaking sum of $7 million, but it meant we had about six months um, to prove we could do anything with ourselves. Um, now, that whole experience, we just we set about in a, almost an engineering and science mindset to say, okay, well, how, do we, how do we ask the right questions, show that we're making progress, share that information with other people, and see if they'll continue to support us? And so that first, I can remember those first few months of just like, okay, can we, what do we know? Like, and what do we not know? Where are the boundaries, conditions that we can go explore? What, what can we push and add as knowledge? And then how can we show people, look, we're making progress. We haven't solved it yet. We didn't save the world from a pandemic. But we, but, but we know something. We're learning something. And that learning will compound, and it's worth you to continue to invest in. And we did a bunch of work that way. And we built some early data showing we could do some things in, in animals in the therapeutic space. And we raised $27 million, and we thought our lives had changed. It's sort of ironic in retrospect, the way people raise money now, and you're kind of like, wow. But back then, it was like, wow, we can hire 25 people. We can keep doing science. And we did. We hired those people, and we, go to, we went into animals, and we started to show that we could actually do, make proteins. If you give an injection, you can make a protein. A protein's going to be a drug, and that means we could cure a disease. And then we did it again, and it didn't work. Dose two didn't work. Okay, let's do that again. <laughs> You know, okay, let's go. Let's make a different protein. Let's do it in mice. Let's figure that out. Dose one, wow, this is great. We're going to be able to treat and cure disease. Dose two, <laughs> nothing. And it kept happening. In fact, it was terrifying. <laughs> it was terrifying. Because here we are, we're a therapeutics company, and we can't give two doses of anything. <laughs> um, but there were people among us who would bought into this idea that we were obsessing over learning and said, no, 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 you're, you're thinking about the problem wrong. That's not a bug, that's a feature. The question is, what's the feature? Re-ask the question. And the feature that we discovered quite painfully and embarrassingly, and it was a very stressful couple of months, was, oh my God, this combination of mRNA and lipid nanoparticle thing we're doing as a therapeutics, it's a phenomenal vaccines platform. In fact, one dose in a mouse, and we, we actually can't do anything wrong to that mouse anymore. Uh, we said, okay, that's, that's crazy. It's too potent, it's happening too fast. You know, let's go do it in other animal species and let's go challenge them with viruses. Let's see if we can give them the flu. Um, this is 2013, 2014. We didn't tell anybody we were doing it because you know, we were Moderna therapeutics, not Moderna vaccines. But we ran the experiments and it was like blindingly clear that all of the animals were protected from flu. They had incredible strong antibody responses. It was so clear that Actually, the scientist who ran the experiment, a guy named Eric Wang, who report, who's actually still with me, um, he didn't want to tell anybody. Uh, he believed he'd done some sort of calculation error, uh, hadn't carried the zero somewhere, and, and that it was like, if I share this, they're going to laugh at me. They're going to find a math error. Um, and so he actually, in secret, repeated the experiment. <laughs> Took another three months. Kept telling me, like, no, 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 it's, you know, it's not done yet, it's not done yet. Um, but the second time around, the same thing happened. It, b blindingly obvious. Like, this was unlike anything we'd ever done. We actually had other vaccine platforms in those same experiments. And it was like the most powerful response anybody had ever seen. It was well tolerated. We could make it stably. We were getting it to the right tissues. Like, all the questions. One problem. It's vaccines, and we weren't a vaccine company. But that didn't daunt us. We said, okay, great. Let's take that information. Let's go actually talk to some investors. We got some investors very excited about it. They supported us. We actually brought in more people and just started to take that information and organize new momentum in a vaccine direction. Now, you know, fast forward, we do that, we do that over the course of a couple of years, create a, about a half a dozen vaccines only in animals. We go, okay, it's time to do this in humans. This is a big deal. We gotta go into humans and show whether this works or not. Um, and so in 2015, we took in two different vaccines, actually, uh, late 2015, early 2016 into humans. We did study in Europe and we did a study in, in the United States and Florida. Interesting place to do a clinical study. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of things you learn about Floridians when you're studying them. <laughs> None of them normal. Uh, the, uh, but we ran the study 
And the data in humans, both Germans and Floridians, uh, was exactly as powerful as what we saw in animals. Probably not surprising, because that's the way molecular biology works. Um, it was just blindingly obvious that this was the best platform we'd ever seen for making vaccines. It was going to change the world, we believe. This is mid-2016. We went and told people, look, we shared the data. For the most part, we got yawn responses. People just didn't believe it. Why, why do I need another vaccines platform? There's so many other ways that I can solve this problem. It's not terribly interesting. It's two different you know, groups of studies. One of them's in Florida, for crying out loud. You know, we're, we're, we're not interested. Um, but we did find people who believed. That information that we'd pulled together in those studies actually started to pull more people into that story. What was 10 when I joined was now 100. And actually, investors were starting to look at it, too. And they say, whoa, whoa, whoa I get it. This is an information technology. But what, meaning messenger RNA is just a way to provide instructions. You're able to do three, four, five different vaccines at the same time. You're like 50 people. If you're able to do that, imagine when you get to 500 what you're going to be able to do. Imagine what you're going to do in a pandemic. And actually, there were people back in 2016 who, who, in, who gave us the next big tranche of money to keep investing based on this belief that there was something there, that data was coming together, and that we were or organizing that information and using it in special ways. Now, that played it forward 2017, 18, 19. We actually built a factory. Um, we had you know, $400 million at that point, and we put 30% of it into a factory. Now, bear in mind, Running clinical trials is very expensive, so $400 million sounds like a lot. <laughs> Building a $150 million factory when you have only two and a half years of cash is terrifying. You're building something that by the time you get the certificate of occupancy, if you haven't raised more money, it's not clear you can pay the power bill. Uh, but we did. Because we really believed, and our investors ultimately also believed, that this was going to change something. And we had no approved drugs. We weren't even in a phase two study. But we thought it was going to make a huge difference in the world. Um, and the only thing that we had to actually build momentum behind that was information. Just the information we could share transparently with investors and say, here's what we've learned. Here's where we think this is taking us. Would you support us? So that's where we were throughout that year. Now we get fast forward all the way to 2019. At the end of 2019, we have taken nine different vaccines into, um, into, the, uh, into human clinical trials. Nine, all nine worked. And by the way, we'd finally broken through on therapeutics, and about half of our pipeline is now in therapeutics. We had a whole bunch of medicines there. We're in cardiac disease, regrowing people's heart. We're in cancer, you know, trying to prevent uh, recurrences of melanoma. We're in rare metabolic diseases, a whole range of diseases. But you know, half of our pipeline is infectious disease vaccines. And at that moment, um, it, towards the end of 2019, we really thought, like, we've, we've shown this. We can take information, make medicines out of it. We can reproducibly do those vaccines. We've built a factory. It's now up and running for a year. Hopefully, this information means a lot of more people will support us. And the answer was no. Um, amazingly enough, and this is one of my favorite things that, uh, that never gets told about Moderna's story, is that in February of 2020, we went public as a company in, in December of 2018. On the stock market, you know, we're, we're, we're listed. Um, and uh, it was a big moment for us, but it was just a chance to raise money. I mean, we didn't make any profit. We weren't making any revenue. So it was just an opportunity for us to continue to invest. And we went public at a share price of $23, which neither here nor there, just it was $23. Um, one year later, all of the success I just described, all the evidence, the entire, nobody in the world had ever done an mRNA vaccine. So we'd done it nine times. Nobody really knew how to make the technology work. And we had a factory. Um, yeah, we were only 900 people in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Norwood, Massachusetts, where we built the factory. But, um, but we were really believers, and we thought the data supported it. So we went back out to the capital markets in February 2020, after the pandemic had begun. Nobody really was worried about it yet. Um, and we asked the market what they thought of us and whether they would support us for another couple of years. And they did, as long as we ate a piece of humble pie. We had a down round, and we sold all the stock at $19. So we had to raise several hundred million dollars. At the end of the day, we found support. But it was, it was this 20% you know, down from a year ago. In other words, thank you for all of that work. In February 2020, 2020 we believe you are worth 20% less than you were just a year ago. And we took it on the chin and said, well, fine. We just need to keep building information. Now, there were a lot of investors at 
prior, prior rounds who were not so happy with that, not so happy with us, but we kept moving forward. Um, and then, of course, COVID happened. And the whole journey of 2020 uh, was surreal. Um, you know, I'm sure there will be most questions on that. Uh, but as I look through you know, out 2020, um, many of these themes of, of how, do we, how are we optimistic about the challenges we're facing, how are we using science to solve problems and ask the right questions, and how do we organize information and then convey that out to the world, ultimately were all the things we just kept doing over and over again throughout the year. Now, 2020, one of the questions I get asked most is, you know, what was that moment like when you decided to create a vaccine to save the world? <laughs> I, I don't really remember. <laughs> it kind of came and went. It was like a Tuesday. <laughs> you know, nobody knew COVID was going to change the world. We were just doing what we do, which is like, oh, we can do that. Yeah, copy, paste. We'll make a new vaccine. Do we want in on this thing? Yeah, we got a factory. We got, you know, we'll go, let's go do this thing. We thought it was an opportunity to demonstrate what we could do uh, technologically and generate more information. I didn't have any idea what it was going to become. The moment came and went. Another question I get asked a lot is, is what, um, when did you know? <laughs> okay, you didn't know. When, when was it obvious? Um, and that really was more in, in February of that year. I think many of us started to realize in February of that year that something was, was different. The thing that, that resonates for me um, was I was, we were tracking very closely, but there was, I have these visceral memories of watching China build a hospital in six days. Everybody remembers those cranes and all that sort of stuff. And just feeling like, that's panic. <laughs> like, that's just outright panic. They're, they're building a hospital in, in six days. Why are they panicking? <laughs> that's not a country that's commonly panicking. Um, and that was probably the moment for me where I said, this is gonna be different. We need to panic. Because the people that are closest to the problem are clearly crossing a threshold. Um, and so February, we decided we're all in. We've got to go after this. Now, we still don't have that much money. You know, we have resources, but we don't have a lot. And so the, for the most part, we, we launched this vaccine. We're working with NIH. We're conduct, conducting a clinical study. Um, and we're trying to scale up our manufacturing. But you know, it takes months to get a hold of raw materials. And it takes billions of dollars to make billions of doses. And so we're actually spending most of that time in 2021, 2020, Begging, anybody, U.S. government, uh, you know, public health officials, the WHO, the Gates Foundation, anybody. We really think this is a big deal. We really think we need to get ahead of it. If we don't start buying raw materials now, in 2021, we're not going to have enough vaccine. And that was, we were walking around with our hat in our hands just saying to people, we, we need more, we need, we need to do more. Um, tragically, we couldn't find anybody who who thought that was really a good idea. Um, probably not the least of which is that we were, we were walking around having these conversations and the other people were like Johnson & Johnson and Merck and Pfizer. Um, you know, these are companies, I'm, I'm representing 1,000 people in, in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, they have 100,000 people, right? I remember the first time Pfizer published some of their clinical results. Among the list of people they thanked you know, for helping move clinical supplies around, was the Pfizer aviation team. <laughs> I was like, you have an aviation team? You have an Air Force? Like, I, I got a guy in a Prius who, drive, who drives samples back and forth from Norwood. It was really, we're, it's not, we're not gonna make it. But we kept going, we kept trying, we kept asking. Um, and finally, we ran out of people to ask in government. And so we actually went back to the same people who'd always supported us. We had phase one clinical data, and we went to the capital markets. We went to, the, we get, went to investors in May of last year and said, look, we think this is a really big deal. Every dollar you give us, we're going to convert into a vaccine. We have no idea if we can get it approved. We have no idea if, if we're going to be able to sell it if we get it approved. But every dollar you give us, we'll use for that. And it was the first time we'd said anything like that because up until then we were a product, we were a platform company, we were building technology, we were doing lots of things, but it was all in. Um, through the uniqueness of American capitalism, $1.3 billion showed up overnight. <laughs> um, nothing like that in the world, totally confusing. Uh, but all of a sudden, we turned to our manufacturing team and said, just go. As fast as you can, as much as you can, go. 
Um, and every one of those $1.3 billion was turned into a raw material of some sort. You know, six month, 12 month lead times. Everything from glass to nucleotides to cholesterol. We have to wrap these things in, in, in fat <laughs> for cholesterol. Um, and we just went. Didn't know it was going to work. We had belief. We'd seen some data. We actually understood the science of what we were doing. But we just went. And we never looked back from that moment forward. Now, the story's played out differently. Um, you know, you fast forward through to November of that year, of last year, and, and we, were, um, we were fortunate. Uh, actually, uh, you know, a whole bunch of weird things happened along the way, like testifying in front of Congress and getting to know people uh, in government like Tony Fauci. But Tony and I had a chance to, to, to you know, be invited to hear the phase three results from the blinded data and safety monitoring board. At that time, we're all in lockdown, right? We're all at home. We're all kind of on WebEx. And so you know, I, and Tony and I were the representative of the government and the company um, who, who get called into that meeting. And they present the data. And it is a home run, beyond all expectations. I remember, like, I also had, used to have Saturday mornings with Tony, which is not Saturdays with Maury, but it was Saturdays <laughs> with Tony, Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, but we'd talk a lot um, in the lead up to that about what do we expect, what would success look like. And both of us were like, look, anything, like the FDA said 50% or better. We said anything better than 75%, we're going to be like, yes. Anything better than 85%, home run. And the Data and Safety Monitoring Board reads it out and it says it's 95% effective. And like, I swear, Tony like beams. Like just, but the only time I've seen the man completely lose character. <laughs> he looks down, I think. He's like looking down because you're on the WebEx camera. And I'm just like, I'm like going on mute and yelling to my family who's outside the room uh, and then kind of coming off mute. And there was this incredible feeling of elation. That like, oh my God. Like all of this risk, all of this work, it's going to mean something. And people usually ask, well, what did that feel like? And I said, it felt amazing for like two minutes. <laughs> Because actually what happened right afterwards is we hung up that call and I go, oh God, we have to make a billion doses of this thing. And making a billion of anything is insane. I mean, just to conceptualize this, over the entire year to run those clinical studies and scale up, we had made 100,000 doses of the vaccine. And at that moment, I called our head of manufacturing and we were talking about it. At that moment, we need to start making 100,000 doses of the vaccine every hour, 24-7, for the next two years. I was like, huh? <laughs> it felt like the Jaws thing. It's like, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> like, like, it was scary. And the whole year of 2021 has felt like just this incredible march just trying to do that. We, I, I wish I could tell you um, what it's like inside of Moderna. Um, I can't. Uh, I often get asked this question about, it must feel great, it must feel great. And it's like, it does and it doesn't. It feels you're really proud, but you're really, really uncomfortable. Um, because every minute of the last year, we have felt like uh, if we're a minute late, if we miss this hour, uh, tens of thousands of people get to die. And that's not something anybody signs up for. But when you realize that that's what's at stake, um, it animates everything you do. And, and if I were to say there's one other group other than those who've raised me that I really would accept any award from personally, it's from those people at Moderna over the last couple of years, even right now. Yes, I'm racing home. Yes, I will work tomorrow. Um, who, are, who are trying to answer that call. Um, who are working through diagnosis of cancer and divorces and problems with their kids' health and unfortunately, some of them dying, uh, but all of them working themselves to the bone because they believe they're doing something meaningful to help other people. It doesn't matter that we're 1,000, well, now 2,000 people, um, and that Pfizer is 100,000. Um, it matters that we feel we're doing everything we can to try and help bring this pandemic to an end. And it's a privilege to be among people who are motivated for those reasons. Um, there are people that I think you all Oh, I am, you all would be, I am incredibly proud of. Um, and it is for them um, and for people like you who, who made me uh, that I am willing, begrudgingly, to stand up here and accept a Distinguished Alumnus Award. <laughs> um, but then just to turn around and go back and get to work. Uh, because uh, we are all a product of each other 
and I am very much a product of all of you and all of them. Um, and it is absolutely an honor um, to pretend that this is a celebration of me, um, and it is, I hope, an, a celebration instead of, of everything that we are doing together, and hopefully will do a get together in the future to, yes, continue to invest in science, to organize information for good, and most importantly in Minnesota and the world, actually give each other optimism and reasons for hope in the future, even uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So it's my privilege to be here. Thank you very much for the award, and sorry for the length of those remarks. <laughs> I have no idea when the booster is going to get approved. <laughs> <laughs> now, the actual answer to that question, because yeah, apparently I'm going to get it soon, <laughs> but that's as specific as I'll give. Yep. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and thank you for that incredibly formative and optimistic uh, talk. We really appreciate it. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, we had a few submitted in advance. I can start with those. Uh, or if some of you uh, have a question right off the bat, we can uh, start, start there. Uh, please, if you have a question, raise your hand, um, and uh, Elizabeth will bring, and uh, Kirsten, uh, the microphone to you. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I guess a topical question. The virus you know, may take a long time be eradicated. You may get eradicated in the US, but not the rest of the world. And the longer it stays, the longer it will mutate. Right? What if we get to a point where we have mutations for which a vaccine is not appropriate? Any comments? Great question. So, um, um, Stephen, I think I'll repeat it just for the folks who, who they yeah, can hear it online. Um, question was that the longer the vac uh, the uh, uh, virus stays with us, the more it will mutate. What happens if we get to the point where we don't have a vaccine that can address those mutated versions? Okay. So I will, um, I'll, I'll first start by saying I, d I don't think we ever eradicate this virus. Uh, and I don't think that's unprecedented. Um, this is not the first beta coronavirus human pandemic. It is the first in the modern era, but actually the first one that we're really aware of happened 120 years ago. Uh, it was called the Russian flu pandemic of 1890. Uh, and it was, uh, when we look at the basic science, it actually was a beta coronavirus that moved out of cows, not bats, and killed people for about two to three years. It was caused by a virus we now call OC43. Now, people called it the Russian flu pandemic, but bear in mind, nobody knew what a virus was back then. <laughs> flu wasn't discovered, and influenza wasn't discovered until 1930. Right? So they called it the flu, but if you actually read some of the history of them, there's these strange symptoms, people dying, of course, but but actually symptoms of people losing their sense of taste and smell. Now the virus that caused that is now called OC43. And it circulates among us to this day, every year. In fact, it's a cause of the common cold. It has mutated massively over the last 120, 130 years. And it has made itself into a form of a virus that's not terrible, doesn't really make you sick. I mean, the cold is annoying. And if you have certain conditions like lung disease, it can actually be life-threatening. But it's really actually pretty well tolerated by most of us. And the virus is just gonna go that path. There is no way that SARS-CoV-2 is gonna be eradicated, even in this country, unfortunately, because we've never eradicated a coronavirus. It just doesn't work that way. They just mutate to a point where the disease is actually pretty mild. The goal of the virus is not to kill us, it's to live among us. And so it's trying to find a way to get there. Uh, it happens to be killing right now. So what we need to do during this period of evolution is we need to basically use vaccines to the question um, to try and make sure that the disease the virus gives you is either non-existent or so mild that you kind of you lose a mask and you do fine. It feels like the common cold. And I think we've made great progress to it. And I'm not sure whether the virus is going to have a chance to break through in such a dramatic way that the vaccine, vaccines will generally stop working. Um, it is possible. 
Um, we are certainly worried about that and monitoring it very closely. There are some versions of the virus. If, you, if, if everybody remember, there used to be concerns about, um, now they're called the beta and gamma strains. They were first identified in South Africa and, and, and Brazil. That was all the concerns going into, into the spring until then Delta emerged. Um, those versions of the virus actually scared me much more. And a version of the virus that was identified in Angola but never got anywhere, thank goodness. Um, which have mutations which allow them to hide from the immune system and hide from the vaccines. But even those versions, actually the vaccines still work pretty well against, 90 plus percent. Um, so what will happen if some omega variant emerges that's terrifying, that it completely evades the vaccines? We'll just update the vaccine. Our, our platform technology is copy and paste. So actually, that 100,000 doses of vaccine we're making an hour, give me about 60 days, and I can make it do anything. And that can be any vaccine. And so we could be putting out four or five million doses a day of any new variant of concern. Um, and that's probably what's most exciting about our technology and how it's useful and why it's probably gotten all the attention uh, from investors and otherwise um, since is that we will just need to copy and paste new information into our vaccine. It is very much like software uh, and address those variants of concern as they emerge. But I'm actually quite optimistic that we're just gonna see this moderation you know, history is the best predictor of the future on the viruses. And I think over the coming years, there will be variants, there will be waves. Nothing as terrifying as Delta, I hope. As long as we can get everybody vaccinated, well, actually the disease will get quite mild. Um, those who are unvaccinated, the first time they get this virus, it will not be mild. Well, if they're unfortunate, they may get fortunate. Um, and, um, and hopefully over the next 100 years, it just becomes the common cold. And we kind of, our generations after us don't really care so much. <laughs> we move on. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm Gordy. I'm a late parent. And like you, I am a graduate of UCSF. But uh, my question is more of a public health issue. Um, how are we going to vaccinate all the question was, how are we going to vaccinate those who are underprivileged, don't have access to the vaccine? Right. So it's a great question. And it, right now, it's important to be clear that nothing about access to the vaccine has to do with, with actually money. It has to do with just the basic issue that we don't have enough. We're, I tried to describe what we're going through as a company trying to build as much as we can, um, which is a grind. I mean, it has not been easy uh, to be delivering at the scales that we are, and we keep trying to go more. Um, but we, all of the customers that we provide vaccine to are governments. We're not providing it to any capitalist entity. We're providing it to the, the governments that manage public health in their, in their geographies. The United States governments are our single largest customer, but we only sell the governments. And we have a very simple view on how we can do that. We are scientists not public health officials. We are you know, a, a private company making a vaccine. Um, we're not the people that are in charge of rationing this sort of thing. Uh, and so the, we just do first in, first out. If the government comes and asks to purchase a vaccine, we say, great, delivery is now six months out. Here you can have it. And in most cases, uh, in fact, in all cases that I'm aware of, it's then delivered free to the people in that country. Uh, now, the government does pay for it. The United States government also pays to deliver elsewhere. The World Bank funds some of this. There's, we sell vaccines to an entity called COVAX and UNICEF at you know, substantially lower prices. But in all cases, our vaccine ultimately goes to that end user, uh, hopefully as it did for all of you, for free. Um, and you know, for the record, the prices are ranging between 10 and like 16 bucks. Right? So this isn't even that expensive for those governments. Um, the issue is we can't make enough. But the, the reality is that a year ago, we were begging for more resources to do more because it takes about a year to bring manufacturing supply online. Um, and we haven't been able to do that. And so one of the things that we decided to do in October of last year, we actually quite publicly said, we will enforce none of our patents. Just, just copy it, go for it. Do whatever you want with our, with our vaccine. Um, it didn't get a lot of attention back in October of 2020. Uh, it gets some now, but still people kind of seem to have missed the point. Um, maybe not the WHO, but we were very clear. We have exactly zero interest in using our intellectual property to prevent people from copying our vaccine. 
during a pandemic, that would be wrong. Um, and so we've had, we said had at it. We, we are going to focus all of our energy on making as many of these doses as we can. And that's where we're just 100% dedicated, as I described, like every hour, every day, 24-7 until this thing's done. But if others copy it, I think it's great. And so from our, from our perspective, it's really not money that's the issue. It's a failure of, of imagination and forethought. And that a year ago, we should have been scaling to make 15 billion doses. Now, I wish we had, but um, I'll tell you, a year ago, like a year ago right now, we didn't think we were going to be the only vaccine standing, us and Pfizer. We, we actually really believed there were going to be like seven or 10 vaccines. Yeah. We're going up against Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca and Merck, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. I mean, we're like the thousand kids in Massachusetts. <laughs> right? We figured we owed a billion. We have to deliver a billion doses. We have to help a billion people. And that's what we were actually able to fund and go after. What's really unfortunately happened is a lot of those other approaches just didn't pan out. And so demand is, exceeds our ability to supply. And I think unfortunately that's created this, 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 this gap. We've continued to try and invest to scale. So next year we're trying to make three billion doses. I hope it's the last year. I know Pfizer's trying to make three, four billion doses. I know there are others trying to work on similar approaches and vaccines and there's others that will hopefully get approved. Uh, but the short answer is we just need to make more. And until we make more, it won't go away. Sorry for the long We have answer. time for one more question. Okay. One more question, Jack Morrison. Uh, uh, the question was, what do you say to someone who doesn't want to get the vaccine? Uh, for reasons other than politics. For reasons other than <laughs> politics, yes. Yeah. Important caveat. Yeah. Because of the politics stuff, I mean, geez, that's complicated. And I'm, I'm, I'm not your guy. Um, on the, look, um, here's the history of, this vi of these viruses. I'm a scientist, and so I'll give a scientific answer. It may be insufficient. Um, you will develop an immune response to this virus. Your choice is whether it's through a vaccine or through infection. That's it. You have, everybody gets it. Everybody's going to have an immune response. Guaranteed, 100% of us are, are carry around immune responses to these circulating coronaviruses over time. So you're guaranteed. You just choose how. I always choose to do things in controlled ways that are predictable, <laughs> if I can, as opposed to uncontrolled ways that can have really terrifying long tail effects. Vaccines don't give you long COVID. Vaccines don't kill you. Right? They don't generally lead you to being hospitalized in ICU with breathing apparatus. They do sometimes, and our vaccine's no exception, give you side effects like, you know, day of malaise, not feeling good, maybe very rarely having a fever. That happens like, you know, 1% of the time in the fever, maybe not having a good day, 10, 15%. They can give you a rash. Guarantee your arm's gonna hurt, <laughs> right? Um, but those sorts of symptoms, you can pick when they happen. You can control it. Right? And you kind of know the scope of, of what that looks like. The other approach is just get COVID. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. Um, and I think it's a very, I think people can choose that path, obviously. But I, I personally couldn't get my head around why that's a good experiment to run. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. It has been such an honor to have you here today. I hope to see you all on Thursday, November 11th for Breakfast at Blake with Jennifer Niels. She's our Northrop class of 1968. She's gonna be traveling for, from Greece where she is an archeologist, art historian, and professor. Finally, I'd like to mention that our tour of uh, the campus will begin at 1030 and the group will meet over in the north entrance. Be well, thank you again for being with us today.